Uh, I love um, I love questions. So my favorite part of the day, my favorite part of my job. So if you have any at any point in time, please jump in. Either you can unmute yourself or you can uh, put them into the chat, which I'll make sure to bring up here so I can keep an eye on that as well. Um, but really, this is just to see, uh, to give you some more resources for when you check out the telescope kit from your library. Uh, kind of by show of hands or the reaction buttons if using Zoom, how many of you have used a telescope before? Okay. Uh, so it looks like we'll be uh, fairly new to most of us. Now, I... Um, I've already seen, or I, I watched the very helpful video that your library has with how, you know, the do's and don'ts of uh, using the telescope. So that was done with Jerry Jones, who's a great person to work with. He, I've worked with him a few times. Um, he's from the Minnesota Astronomical Society. So if you haven't watched the video uh, that your library has already produced, please do. I'm not gonna cover too much of that tonight. So I wanted to keep these two sessions separate, um, but we're gonna have fun tonight. And uh, we'll start with some telescope basics. Uh, so there's about two different basic types of telescopes. So you might see ones like this, which is which are refracting. Uh, so they use two lenses instead of mirrors. And so in this case, um, the light comes in to the front of the telescope and there's actually lenses built in here. And then your eyepiece is at the very back, um, in this case on our screen at the very right hand of our image. So it's almost like the light makes a straight path through uh, to your eyepiece. Uh, so these are very common and they're great to use. They're often smaller in diameter uh, just because the way light goes through lenses. Um, but if you have one or if you've used one before, these are really nice kind of backyard telescopes uh, to use here. The other type of telescope uh, that you might come across is a reflector. And this is the type that uh, the library has so that you check out through their kits. And so in this one, it uses mirrors instead of lenses. And so we'll go a little bit more detail on how this particular telescope works um, and then what you can see through it. So in a reflecting telescope that uses mirrors, there's a primary mirror at the very back. So if you look kind of on the lower right hand uh, side of the image here, uh, this mirror inside the telescope, the job of that mirror is to collect the light. You can imagine this as being a big, huge bucket. Uh, the bigger diameter, the more light it can collect, kind of like a, the bigger the bucket, more rain that'll fall into it. And so you'll often see telescopes talking about uh, their size. And in this case, we're talking about the diameter of that primary mirror or that, that primary lens if we were using a refracting telescope. Um, but then there's another telescope in this, in, or another mirror in this telescope. Uh, it's a secondary and it reflects the light or redirects the light back out into the eyepiece. And so the eyepiece's job is actually not to collect light, it's actually to magnify the image. Um, so if we were to tra trace the path that light takes for telescopes, it'll come in from far away from our, our stars. It'll reflect off that primary mirror in the back. It'll uh, redirect up to the secondary mirror, kind of just behind the eyepiece there. And the secondary mirror will then make the light come out through our eyepiece. Now, um, a question I get a lot of times is, what is the magnification this telescope can give me? Well, it turns out the telescopes, they do not magnify things. That is not the job of the, of the telescope. If we go back a slide here, the telescope itself is the mirrors and their job is to collect light. So the bigger diameter mirror, the more light it can collect. It's actually the eyepiece, the part that's interchangeable. That's the job of the eyepiece is to magnify things. So you can change your magnification on a telescope just by changing out the eyepiece. So we take a look at um, a quick equation. You do not have to uh, know any of this. I just thought in case there's anybody out there interested, I'd include it, uh, but just a little bit of math, but you can ignore it if it's, if it's too much. Uh, so to calculate the magnification of a telescope, what we do is we take the focal length of the telescope of how long it takes the telescope to focus things. And then we take the focal length of the eyepiece and we divide the two. And so that's pretty much just our basic equation for how much magnification we can get out of um, a telescope. In the case of what comes in the kit, um, your, the telescope is a focal length of 450 millimeters. And then the eyepiece 
uh, can go from 24 millimeters, which is kind of the wider field of view. So you'll get the kind of the biggest picture there when you look through it. And then I'll start you off at about just over 18 power or magnification about 18 times. But your eyepiece can actually go down to um, eight millimeters. So the smaller the number on the eyepiece, the more zoomed in you'll get on your, uh, on your object. And kind of the more zoomed in you'll get, the more, um, again, magnification you'll get. So in this case, your eyepiece can get down to eight millimeters, which gives you a magnification of just over 56 times. So you have a good range of magnification powers here, just on the eyepiece that comes in the kit. Okay. Now, if you're planning your observing session, there's a few things you're gonna to wanna to remember to bring with you. Uh, bring a red flashlight, because we all have our phones, but our phone's flashlight has white light, and you want to be able to see in the dark, which means you don't wanna be shining white light around. That'll make your pupils contract and, um, and you'll lose your night vision. So by bringing a red flashlight, either one you find or one that comes in the kit, or even I've taken a regular flashlight, used some nail polish or paint, painted it on like a plastic baggie and then just taped it on top or used a rubber band to stick it on top. And uh, you just put a red filter over a regular flashlight and that would work great as well. By using red light, it allows you to see, but it also allows your pupils to stay nice and big so you can still see in the dark. So that is one of the biggest things that you need to do is bring a red flashlight. Do not use white light until you are done and you need to pack up and make sure you didn't then you drop your wallet on the ground. So do not use white light. You'll get a lot of people mad at you if you use white light. You'll also want to bring your star map. Uh, there is one in the kit, um, but then I will, in a few slides here, share with you the Bell Museum's star map, which we have hard copies at the museum if you've ever come to this, but we also uh, put them on our website. So I'll share that link with you in a little bit. Um, so we'll go over how to read our star map here. Uh, here in the summer, you will want to bring bug spray um, because they will swarm you if you don't. I've also often dressed in long, light, uh, long sleeves and pants, uh, just something nice and light so that way they can't get to me. Because um, in the summertime, that is one of the most annoying things. And one of the things that will make you pack up your telescope way sooner is all of the bugs. So in the summertime, bring bug spray. Uh, you'll also probably want to bring a chair. Because if you're taking turns of the telescope, somebody might want to sit down and just view the sky, look at some constellations, um, see if you can see any shooting stars, that type of thing. And with the telescope in the kits here, uh, they're tabletops. So they don't have tripods of their own, but you will need to set them on a table of some sort. So you'll need a nice sturdy table. Or if you have a table, maybe a folding table, just make sure you don't lean on it too much because that will cause uh, the telescope to get misaligned. But you will need a table with this telescope. Now I'm going to pause here. Are there any questions so far? So we've actually covered quite a lot in just a short period of time. Okay. Again, I love questions. So go ahead and you can answer, ask them through the chat if you want to, or you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask them live. Um, well, we've covered basics of a telescope, so we've now covered what to bring with you when you go observing. Um, if you go out in the, the winter, you dress for the weather. So bundle up, bring a thermos of your favorite hot uh, beverage. Um, but that's really the big difference between summer observing and winter observing is bug spray in the summer, bundle up for the winter time. Okay, but this is where we're going to get a little participatory here. Um, here is our star map. So this is one you can download on our website here um, at, on the link on the screen, or you can use the planisphere that's in the kit that is a perpetual where you can just spin the wheel and line up your date and time and so that will, that will work any time of year. So the one here on our screen is for July and August, the summer, and specifically for about 930 at night. Now, the reason why we date and time the maps when we print hard copies of them is because the sky rotates. Uh, well, more precisely, the Earth rotates on its axis, but we also orbit around the sun. And because of these two motions, we actually see different parts of the sky at different parts of the year. So uh, this map is really good for here in July and August around 930 at night. Now I'm gonna give you a little bit, I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds or so, take a look at the map and see what you notice. Uh, let's put something in the chat of what you notice. Maybe something looks goofy to you, or you said like, hey, I recognize something. 
take a few moments here and just take a look at the map and what do you notice about this map? Okay. 30 seconds is actually a really long time and it's even longer on a virtual call here. Where I can't see you guys looking and, and trying to think about what's going on here on this map. Um, so one thing that I often uh, get a response to when I ask this question is, you know, there's this gray streak through the map. Well, that gray streak through the map is absolutely, it's the Milky Way. Uh, so this is something that you would see when you're outside of the cities, when you're far enough away from the light pollution that we have here in the middle of the cities or in the suburbs. So we have it on the map because it's a great thing to see and, um, and look for. And here, as we're getting the summer, we're actually staring towards the center of our galaxy. So it's going to be the brightest throughout the year. It's going to be the easiest to find, if you will. Uh, and it turns out that the center of our galaxy is actually kind of down towards the bottom of this map. If you look towards the bottom, there is a constellation named Sagittarius. And you can kind of see, it almost looks like a teapot here with a handle and a, the lid and the spout. And the center of the galaxy is just off the spout, kind of here around M8, M20. And so here in the summertime, we are looking towards the center of our galaxy. So this big kind of gray band across the map is actually going to be the biggest or most um, present of, of any time during the year. So it's a great thing to see if you get a chance to go look for it away from any city lights. Um, are there any other observations you, that you've made about this map? Uh, you might have noticed that it's a circle. Well, that's because if you were to stand in one spot and then spin around and look in all directions, what you would see would trace out a circle. And so the outer edge of our map here is actually the horizon. And so that is uh, if something's closer to the horizon, it's going to be close or closer to the outer edge of this map. It's going to be closer to your horizon, which means at the center of our map is actually going to be the point directly above us when we're outside. And so that's called the zenith. And so you can kind of start gauging where things are in the sky by are, are they closer to the um, outer edge of the map, so the horizon, or are they closer to the center of the map, so are they going to be more straight above us when we're outside looking? If you're looking here, you may be noticing that um, something seems to be goofy about where east and west are on the map. They, they almost seem like they're backwards. And that's because star maps are not meant to be red facing down and facing the ground. What you do to read this star map um, is you'd find the direction you're facing. So right now I am facing east. So I take my star map um, and I'd put e the east indicator towards my torso and I actually read it by flipping it up over my head. So this way, north, south, east, and west are all properly aligned to the sky. This also means that I don't really have to move my head very much because if it's on the ground, uh, I could say, okay, I'm looking at south and then, oh, but south is over there. Am I looking in the right spot maybe? By putting it and reading it above your head, like it's um, kind of like it's, it's printed, you can say, oh, I'm looking in front of me and I see Pegasus. So I know I have to look just a little bit that way. But I'm looking over to the right of my map to find Sagittarius. So I just have to look a little bit, a little bit that way. So maps are meant to be read, kind of looking up in that orientation of the sky. Ah, great question. Isn't the North Star in the center? No. It would be if we were at the North Pole, though. Here in Minnesota, we're about halfway between the equator and the North Pole. And so the North Star is going to be halfway between the zenith, which is straight up, and our horizon. So let's start there. Let's take a look at our map here and see if we can find the North Star. Uh, I'll give you a hint, the North Star, that's the title. But the specific name of the star is Polaris. And maybe you've already found it. Uh, but there is a kind of a trick to finding it because it's a myth that the, the North Star is the brightest star in our sky. It's actually not, it's quite dim. And so there is a trick to finding it. First, you find the Big Dipper, which is actually fairly easy to find even in the cities with all of our light pollution. And so our Big Dipper here on the star map 
is kind of over in uh, kind of the, the Northwest, if you will. Let's see if I can grab my marker and maybe I can mark this up here. Okay, so we have the Big Dipper here. Oh, it's not drawing. There we go, let's see if this works. So we have our Big Dipper here. And it actually has a quite a few bright stars. And so it is one, it's quite very large in the sky. So it's a good thing we call it the Big Dipper and the stars are fairly bright. And so what we can do is we can use the outer two stars of our dipper here and draw a straight line between them until we hit our north star, Polaris. And so these outer two stars of the north of the big, uh, the big dipper here are called our pointer stars because they point at Polaris, our north star. And so Polaris here is actually quite dim. Um, I want to say it's between thir the 30th and the 50th brightest star in our sky. So it's actually pretty far down the list. That is at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper right here. And so our North Star, because of where we are here um, in Minnesota at our latitude of 45 degrees north, the North Star is going to be almost exactly halfway between the horizon and the zenith because of our latitude. Yeah. Are there any other questions as we're looking at our star map, kind of learning how to orient ourselves? So if you do think of anything, please go ahead and jump in. Um, but let's take a look at a few other things on our star map here. Um, we've covered the horizon and the zenith. We've covered the Milky Way and our directions. But you'll notice that uh, there's different symbols on the map itself. And uh, in the map online, if you want to download it or if you pick it up in a hard copy, we do have a key to it. Um, but some of the brighter stars are going to have kind of this uh, more star-shaped um, icon. The dimmer stars are going to be uh, different circles. So some of the ones that are a bit bi uh, bigger or slightly brighter are going to be slightly bigger circles. But the smaller the circle is on the map, the dimmer the star is going to be. So like stars over here up in our northwest, uh, especially around the constellation links, are going to be very hard to see because they're going to be very dim. And so you need a really clear uh, dark sky in order to see those. Um, a few other things, you might see these little blue squares and we'll get to those later. Those blue squares mark some deep space objects that you can see. And those are some of the objects that you're probably gonna need the telescope in order to look at. And I have selected a handful of them for us to investigate or a uh, handful of starting objects for you to look at once you do check out the telescope kit. You'll also notice down in the Southeast, we have two planets visible in our evening skies once the sun sets. Um, so right now, um, this month and through the summer, we are going to have Saturn and Jupiter um, in our skies here uh, about 930. If you go outside and look right as the sun is setting, so it's not on our current map because it's a little bit later or it's earlier than 930 at night. Um, if you go outside and look in the west just as the sun is setting, uh, you could start to see Venus and Mars as well. So there's other planets visible throughout the night. This map just happens to be for 930. Yes, meteor showers, they are on our list. Absolutely, we'll talk about them. Okay, so we have a, a basic orientation to our star map. Um, so let's go see what else is out there. Oh. Okay, um, one, you can look from your backyard, but two, here is a, a website that, or a link to a map that some of us here at the Bell Museum have put together. We've kind of compiled our favorite sites to go look at, some of our dark sky sites. Um, so a lot of them are kind of focused around here, the Twin Cities. You can see a few markers that are a little bit further out if you wanted to travel. Uh, so this is just a, a few staff recommendations from here, um, from people at the Bell Museum for darker skies if you are trying to look deeper space objects or trying to catch a glimpse of the Milky Way. Uh, so I've also shared this through your library so they can reshare these links if you don't have quite a chance to write them down tonight. Um, but this is kind of useful. I've used it um, throughout the summer as well. So summer highlights. Uh, if you've never used a telescope before, or even if you do, I actually like to start with the moon. Uh, because the moon is going to be one of the brightest things in the sky. And in some cases, like around the full moon, it's actually going to give off a lot of light pollution of, of itself. And so it's going to block out some of the light from those dimmer objects or dimmer stars. 
but it also gets you give you a chance to kind of get into the rhythm of using the telescope that night you know each night is slightly different some nights it might work better than others um but that moon is wonderful to look at now I've also looked at the moon during the daytime, and that's actually one of my favorite things to do. It doesn't quite have as much contrast as it does at night, um, but the uh, a crescent moon like we're having out uh, kind of today against a blue sky makes for a really nice sight. So you can use the telescope during the daytime if you look at the moon. Never, ever, ever, ever use a telescope to look at the sun unless you have proper solar filters. Um, and I, those do not come in your kits and sunglasses do not count as proper solar filters. So you can use your telescope to look at the moon during the daytime, um, but the rest of it will all be evening observing. Uh, and if you are going to look at the moon, uh, my favorite time to look at the moon is actually during like the first quarter. And so here is a picture that we took at the Bell Museum through our telescopes. Uh, this was a few days after the first quarter. Um, but the reason I like it during this first um, early phases before you get to the full moon is because the full moon will wash everything out and you won't be able to see that much detail. But when you get the moon like this, where you can only see part of it, um, you get really stunning detail. So if you look along that line that separates day and night, that's called the terminator. And so that line here is actually where I like to focus my telescope. Um, so you can see details. That. For instance, here's kind of a, a more uh, higher magnification image. So I was, we were using a different eyepiece in this case. And you can start to see the craters and you can start to see some of the mountains that are in the center of the craters and the shadows they're casting. So you get to see a lot more detail here. And another reason I love to start with the moon um, is because it helps me align my telescope, making sure that the finder scope and the telescope are in, in alignment. I'm not spending a bunch of time hunting around to see if I'm pointing the right part of the sky. But the moon, I feel like, is often taken for granted because it's in the sky. We see it every month, and sometimes we forget that's out even during the day. But there is magnificent detail to be seen here. Um, so you could actually spend all night just looking at the moon and look, looking for the different craters, uh, different Apollo landing sites. In the kit, I believe there is a moon map that comes with it. So you could spend all night just looking for the different features of the moon here. Uh, so that's why actually one of my favorite things to start with and the favorite thing to look at um, when I take my telescope out. I, I always want to try to schedule those times for around the first quarter moon. Um, so I know I have at least one thing that I can see through the telescope. Um, but some other summer highlights. Uh, we do have several planets in the sky. So I already kind of mentioned this, but Mars and Venus are in the west right after sunset. So they're not going to be out long after sunset. And again, never point the telescope at the sun, but you can start to see them. Now, compared to our gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn, which, out late, which are out later in the evening, you might be a little bit disappointed with these two because they are small planets. And even though they're closer to us than Jupiter and Saturn, they're not gonna be much more than just kind of a small circle or small pinpoint of light, even through the telescope. Um, but they are wonderful things to see in the sky. I just like using, like using my eyes and knowing that as the sun is setting, I'm seeing a bright spot over there next to it, that that is Venus or that is Mars. And you will actually see kind of a reddish hue to reddish hue to Mars, uh, so you will be able to tell that it is that red planet. Um, around that 9:30 time, we're going to get Jupiter and Saturn coming up in the southeast. And so, if you stay up later in the night, if you take it out 10, 10:30, uh, you'll get them higher and higher in the sky, and so you'll get some better clarity the higher something is in the sky. If you're using the telescope to see something on the horizon, you're going to probably have a lot of heat waves coming off the ground, um, and that might distort your image. So it's probably best to pick a target that's higher in the sky. And so you'll have an easier uh, shot at seeing a nice stable image of it. But Jupiter and Saturn are great to see. Uh, you can start to see the rings around Saturn. Uh, uh, Galileo, when he first pointed the telescope at Saturn, he didn't know what those rings were. So uh, he called them a planet with ears. And so you can, you can see those rings of Saturn um, with, with your telescope or with the, the, um, the, the Kitts telescope. Uh, Jupiter, uh, which is not too far away um, this summer, you can actually on a very nice, clear, stable night, so you don't want it too windy, you don't want to be leaning on the table with the telescope, you can sometimes start to pick out some of the stripes of Jupiter, some of those cloud bands, um, and potentially you could see up to four moons of Jupiter. 
So Jupiter will be the big thing in the middle. And then sometimes you, if you take a look and you actually stare at it for a little while, you can see little points of light on the sides of Jupiter. And those are Jupiter's four Galilean moons. Those are the four moons that Galileo first saw when he pointed his telescope at Jupiter. Uh, a fun sight if you have the telescope checked out. Um, July 25th, we'll actually have uh, the moon right between Jupiter and Saturn. So the moon will wash out the planets a little bit, so they're not going to be as bright comparatively. Um, but all three will be kind of like in a right little line there in our southeastern sky um, at the end of the month. And so you wouldn't have to adjust your telescope too much to see all three if you wanted to see them fairly close together. Um, but Susan, right now we come to our meteor showers because there are a few out this summer. Um, the first one is the Delta Aquarius meteor shower. And so this one's actually kind of a, a smaller shower and it's gonna happen around the gibbous moon here. Um, so it peaks later this month. Now, because the moon will be kind of in gibbous phase, the moon's gonna give off a lot of light pollution. So you, you might not see that many meteors from this particular shower. Uh, meteor showers are named after the constellation that the um, meteors will radiate from, in this case, Aqu Aquarius. Um, but that does not mean you have to look in that constellation to find them. They can actually be seen streaking across anywhere in the sky. Another one that's actually kind of uh, a bigger one to take a look for, and some people actually, I know some people who schedule their vacations around going to a dark sky site, is the Perseid meteor shower. Now the Perseids here kind of overlap with the Delta Aquarians a little bit, but the Perseids peak um, on the night of August 12th into the night of August 13th. And this will be better because this is just after, um, I believe this is just after uh, a new moon here. So I think the new moon was on August 8th. I can just double check that quick. Uh, the new moon's on August 15th. So this is just before the new moon, which means the moon is not gonna be in the way this year for this shower. Uh, it will not be giving off a lot of light pollution for it. Um, so you can see meteors from either these showers from late July, uh, kind of through the end of August, uh, but the Delta Aquarius peak at the end of July um, and Perseids peak here, um, August 12th into 13th. Again, you can see them at any of those surrounding nights, um, but the Perseids have the potential on a clear dark sky site, have the potential of up to about 60 meteors per hour. So you can see quite a few of them for the Perseids here coming up in August. Now, are there any questions about any of these? Because again, I've been talking for a while. I want to give you the time to ask any questions if you're wondering about any of these particular summer highlights. Okay. I'll ask a question. Go um, for it. So when you're watching a, looking at a meteor shower, I mean, you see it with your bare eyes, right? But then... Yes. It, yeah. Like, can you see it through the telescope or is it, would it be moving too fast to try to actually... Uh, since since you never know where the meteors are going to come from, um, the meteor showers are best to be seen with just your eyes. You're not going to be able to find one and track it fast enough with a telescope. Um, so yeah, the meteor showers are definitely something you just want to sit back and enjoy. Use that chair, chair I told you to bring and just enjoy and, and see who can spot the most. You can make a fun game out of it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Well, let's jump into some other highlights coming up this summer. Um, one of my favorite things to look at during the summer is actually in the, um, in the, it's called an, um, I'm blanking on the name now. It's not a constellation. Um, but we see here this kind of teal triangle. This is called the summer triangle asterism. That's the word that, uh, uh I couldn't remember. So the, the summer triangle here is called an asterism. So it's not a constellation because it's not one of the official 88 that are out there, but it connects these three very prominent constellations in our summer sky. And in this case, Elbirio is a star in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. So if we follow um, Deneb, which is this brighter star up here um, in Cygnus, we can follow the long neck of the swan and the wings kind of cutting across here. And Elbirio is at the head of the swan. Now to our eyes, without using a telescope, it looks like one star. But when you point your telescope at this star at the very head of the swan, you will actually see two. And so here's a picture of these two stars. Um, I have seen this, this star through a telescope here at the Bell Museum. Um, I did not take a picture of it, so I had to borrow this picture from, the, um, from online. But what do you notice about these two stars? You might notice 
that you can actually tell they're color, colorful. Um, it turns out stars come in a bunch of different colors. And in the case of these two, um, this one star, what we've named Elberio as one star, is actually two stars. And these two stars, one of them is this blue color and one of them is this kind of golden yellow color. And you can see this color difference through a telescope. So this color difference actually helps us figure out and tells us that these stars are actually two different temperatures. So if you go outside and you see like a star, uh, there's a bright red star in the constellation of, uh, of uh, Scorpius, that star is actually quite cool. That might be around 6,000 degrees on the surface. Uh, as a star gets is hotter, as it has more fuel to burn, it will burn more in the medium temperatures around 10,000 degrees like our sun, which is a yellow star. And then as a star has even more fuel to burn, it will be burning very, very hot. And in that case, it will give off enough energy to give off blue light. So in this case, we will see, or you can see these two stars that appear to so close together that one of them is actually much hotter than the other. And you can tell the color of these two stars. This is one of my favorite things to look at through a telescope here in the summer season. Now, we do call this a double star. Um, you might sometimes hear people wondering if it's a binary star, um, but there is a difference between those two terms. So a binary star is when two stars orbit each other. In this case, um, data is pointing out these two stars, while they lie in the same line along our line of sight, they're actually very far apart from each other. So this is a double star because it just happens to look like they're, they're near each other from our perspective on Earth but they're not actually gravitationally bound together. So they're just in the same direction along our line of sight, but they are not orbiting each other, which would be the case of a binary star system. So this is just a double star. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead, use the chat or just pipe on it. Um, but let's keep going. What are some other summer highlights? Um, not too far away from the summer triangle. Actually, if you look over at the left-hand side of this image, uh, we're still seeing the constant of Lyra, the Lear. Uh, if we go back, we can see that Lyra is kind of this upper um, right corner of the, of the summer triangle. So we're not going too far away here, kind of star hopping a little bit. Um, so not too far away, we find the constellation of Hercules. Uh, Hercules is best known uh, for, it's what we call the keystone. It's these four stars here in the middle. They don't quite make a square because they're not quite um, the same uh, side uh, lengths, uh, but you'll find that keystone there. It, it will take a little bit of, of practice and it will take a little bit of concentrated looking. You're not gonna be like, oh, look, there it is. Like you can see a full moon. Um, but in between two stars along its side here is M13, which is a globular cluster. And so here is um, a picture of this globular cluster through a very nice, large telescope. Um, you can see that some of these stars are blue, some of them are kind of that golden color, so you can tell that they are of different ages. And it turns out this cluster has hundreds of thousands of stars, and they're all kind of gravitationally bound in this cluster here. And so globular clusters are one of my favorite things to look at at any time of year. The globular cluster here in Hercules just happens to be like a primo one to look at. It's like one of the best ones to see um, out there. So I highly recommend this one. And to kind of give you a comparison, you will probably not see this much detail. You're probably not going to see the colorful stars in it with, uh, with the telescope that you're borrowing from the library. You might see something a little bit more like this, a little fuzzy patch, but you are still going to see a couple hundred thousand stars through the eyepiece here. Now, I'm going to reiterate a point that uh, Jerry Jones had made in the video uh, resource through the library, is that when you're looking through a telescope, don't just look for a few seconds and then walk away. When you're looking through a telescope, you know, look there and take some time and really let your eyes adjust looking through the eyepiece and see what there is to see and kind of moving your eye around and looking at even the edges. Because sometimes the longer you take to look and as you move your eye around, your eye will catch new things as it adjusts to its view. Ah, great question. So do the different temperatures of stars and the colors of them mean the different ages of the stars? Yes, um, relatively speaking. So in this cluster, if you go back just an image and I go back to the nice one where we can kind of see the different um, star colors here. In clusters, such as a globular cluster as this or an open cluster, which will have still a couple hundred stars, just not as quite tightly packed as this one. 
these stars are all gravitationally bound because they're all uh, formed roughly the same time. So they're all born at the same time, but they were not all born or they were not all formed the same mass and the same fuel. And so um, red stars are going to be towards the end of their lifespans because they have used up more of their fuel. Blue stars can be towards the beginning of their lifespans. So in this cluster right now, they're all roughly the same age. However, you can see by their colors, they're not all the same point in their lifespan. Some of these stars, while they were all formed at the same time, will not live as long as some of the others in the same cluster. And so it won't give a direct estimate of their age, um, but it'll give you a relative where they are in their lifespan. You can use their color and their temperature if you have a tool called the HR diagram to really figure out where they are in their age and then give like an actual number to it. So we do have tools that can do that, but just visually as we're looking at stars in our night sky, um, you can just know that red stars are gonna be cooler and they're towards the end of their lives. Blue stars will be hotter and they're towards the beginning of their lives. And middle stars like our sun are just middle-aged and they're just kind of doing their thing. Yep. But great question. I love talking about stars and the electromagnetic spectrum and the colors and temperatures and ages. It's my favorite topic in astronomy. Okay, but M13, I highly encourage you to find this. Um, it's nice and high here in the summer sky. It's a great object to find. Um, we skip over to the Big Dipper um, and Ursa Major. Uh, there's a few objects here that I highly recommend taking a look at. So we have the Big Dipper here, which is just the tail end of Ursa Major. So the bear itself goes up to the, the nose, and the front legs, and the back legs. But if we follow the arc of the handle, the Big Dipper here, and kind of arc off to the end, just below the end star is M51, which is actually a galaxy. Um, so this one has, this image has a little bit of processing in it, um, but you can still see these little smudges when you look through a telescope in your backyard. And I've actually even seen this um, from my backyard here in the middle of Minneapolis uh, with one of the Bell Museum's telescopes that I borrowed. So um, if you take your telescope out or take the telescope out to a little place a little bit further away from city lights, you will also have a really good chance of seeing those little smudges. Um, I, again, I don't think you'll see the high definition of the spirals and the dust lanes that this particular image shows, but you can see that Whirlpool galaxy, that big one here. And then it actually has a smaller, uh, I believe it's a dwarf galaxy just off to the tail of it in the lower right corner of this image. So you can see galaxies here this summer as well. And this is a great one to view. Um, it's actually out most of the year because it's right near the Big Dipper. And we can see the Big Dipper any time of year. Yep. Um, will the Doppler shift affect the color of a star? Uh, visually to our, our eyes, no. The Doppler shift comes in when we're looking at the spectra of the star. And so we'll, uh, there'll be slight uh, shifts in the spectral lines that you can notice if you have something that measures that. So to our eyes, we're not going to see a, a yellow star turn red or turn blue based on if it's moving towards us or away from us. Um, you'll, you'll need a little bit of more equipment to, to see that, but it, it is there, that that shift is there. Mm -hmm. Or it can be there, I should say. Okay. Um, sticking with the Ursa Major and the Big Dipper here, um, we're not going to go too far away from the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, if you go up at the handle of the Dipper, and it's labeled right on the Bell Museum star map, Mizar and Alcor. It's this middle star of the three stars of the handle. If you look at that star on our map here, it looks like one. If you look at the star with just your eyes, you can actually tell that it's two. And that was actually um, the eye test for the be, be joining the Roman army. If you could distinguish two stars by looking at the central star of the Big Dipper, your eyesight was good enough to join the Roman army way back when. Now, if we use a telescope, we can actually see those two stars are actually each individually two stars of themselves. So it's very similar to Alberio in that these are uh, double star systems. And in, some, in this case, uh, Mizar is over on the right-hand side of the image and Alcor is over here on the left. Um, but then Mizar itself is a binary system. So you can see now through a telescope, you can start to pick out that there are actually two stars in this one star that we thought we, though just the one star we thought we saw with our eyes. And so here we do see this double star and potentially depending on how long you take to look and how, what the weather conditions are, uh, you might be able to see that binary star system as well um, in Mizar. Okay, so I'm gonna throw a challenge out there for you um, because here's another object that is back over in the summer triangle, but it is quite dim. 
It's a deep space object called M57. This is the ring nebula. So we jump back over to the summer triangle. Uh, before we're looking at Alberio, which is the head of Cygnus the Swan here on kind of the left side of the summer triangle. If we look on the right side here, we see the star Vega. Uh, it'll be nice and bright. If any of you have seen the movie or read the book of Contact, the movie has Jodie Foster, Matthew McConaughey from way back when. Um, this is the star that she travels to in that movie. But not too far um, away from this star is M57 here. And this is the Ring Nebula. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of it. So we're going to pick up a, a bunch of color. And what it is, is a star or a dead star at the center here that has ejected all of its material out into space. And so through Hubble and its filters, we can see that it's had different materials. So it's had hydrogen and helium. And I believe this blue is even some oxygen that's just after it uses up its fuel, it died and it just ejected all the material into space. So we see this kind of ring of ejected material around the central star. Um, but here at the Bell Museum, we, we don't have access to Hubble. So we saw something a little bit more like this through our telescopes here. And this is be a little bit more like what you might be able to see. And this one will definitely take some time. You might have to stand at your telescope um, for a few minutes to really let your eyes adjust and look off to the edges and see if your peripheral vision can catch this object. So it's gonna be far away and it's gonna be faint through the telescope, but you can see it. And so here um, it will appear kind of more black and white because there's not enough light coming from it to uh, activate the, the colorful cones, it, the detectors in our eyes to pick up color. Um, but you'll still see that kind of uh, gray, the black and white features of this object. So this one is a challenge though. So um, if you're up for it, definitely try to find this one. Okay, are there any questions? Again, I'm gonna pause just for a little bit to see if anything, if anybody thought of anything new. Okay. Now, if we go back to our star map, and again, if you're, you're typing, keep typing. Um, if we go back to our star map here, um, We've talked about a lot of it, but I've kind of focused on a few um, highlight constellations this summer. So we definitely looked at the Big Dipper. We saw the Summer Triangle and the three star, three constellations that it connects. And we focused on kind of Hercules here. And you can see that those things are kind of towards the center of our map again. Um, and that's because, like I said before, if things are in the center of our map, they're not going to have to go through as much of our atmosphere and it'll give you a clearer picture. It'll give you a clear, uh, clear view. Um, things down towards the horizon, definitely look for Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, as the night goes on, they will get higher in the sky as the season goes on. So if you wait until later, later in the summer, early fall, they will be higher in the sky. So you'll have plenty of time to view, uh, to look for Jupiter and Saturn in our sky. Um, but I mentioned it briefly at the beginning when we were kind of orienting ourselves to our star map, that there are these other objects around with these little blue squares. And a lot of them have M number, an M designation in front of them. Um, and that M designation is actually from Messier. He was a French astronomer who was specifically hunting for comets. And I don't remember the, the century that he was doing this in, um, but what he ended up finding were not necessarily a lot of comets, which was his original goal, but he found um, a bunch of deep space objects. And so these are some of those M numbers that we see on our maps. And so these are some objects that you will need a telescope to help you find. Uh, M1 is the Crab Nebula. So if you check out the telescope kind of in more in the winter time, this is gonna be part of Taurus the Bull. Um, there are plenty of other galaxies here. You can see uh, so like uh, here kind of towards the, the left-hand side, a galaxy kind of on its edge, M31, that's the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, one of my favorite things, though, is um, the Pleiades cluster, M45, just below that box here. Um, again, kind of middle, middle left here. M45 is an open cluster. So we saw M13, which is the globular cluster in Hercules. M45 here is an open cluster. There's not quite as many stars. That is also in Taurus the Bull, which is coming up um, kind of late fall and through the winter time. So there are stars. There are galaxies to see out here. There are nebula. Um, summertime is nice because it's warmer out, but you also have to stay up way later to get for it to get dark to see some of these things. Um, so my favorite objects do come out in the wintertime because even though it's really cold, 
Um, it gives for better viewing because the air is more stable, but then also I can go observing as, you know, at 6.30, 7 o'clock at night because the sun's already down. Um, so there's no bad time of year to go observing. They all have their pros and their cons, uh, but Meze objects here, as we looked at our map, um, are great, uh, a great way to start observing, give you some target objects to look at if you wanted to look beyond just some of the stars that make up our constellations. Now, uh, before we get to any last questions, I do want to point out another challenge. I didn't put a picture here because summer's not the prime time to view it. But if you look over in the upper uh, corner here in the northeast, uh, there's one M31. That is the Andromeda galaxy. Now, on a nice clear night, a nice dark clear night, you can actually see this with your naked eye. This object is, is actually the farthest object that humans can detect with their eyes without using a telescope. It will look like just a little smudge, like somebody took um, some pencil marker and just kind of smudged it um, on a page. Now through the telescope, you will see a little bit uh, larger, kind of more fuzzier patch, but the Andromeda galaxy is another great thing to look at. Um, it's best to view it in the fall when it's a bit higher in the sky, when you don't have to worry as much as much about the air uh, distorting your image, but it is starting to come up here um, in the summertime around 930 in our Northeast. So that's another target that I would challenge you to find if you are looking for a challenge um, for some deep space objects here. Okay, with that, I, I purposely left some time here at the end for questions. I didn't want to talk the entire time, um, but if you have any, I'm happy to answer them now. Here is my contact information. If you think of anything later, you feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may, may have. So which is which is better, a, a reflector or a refractor telescope? And are they different purposes? Uh, what's better? Um, yeah. It all depends on what. Well, one, what your budget is, because they 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 do different things. If we go back, go all the way back here and, and see them different. Um, so the refractors are going to be smaller diameters. Uh, there we go. Yep. Uh, the refractors are going to be smaller diameters and they might be easier to store, but they are going to be quite long. Um, the reflectors are going to be kind of maybe potentially shorter and more compact. Um, but uh, because they're, they're mirrors, they give a little bit longer uh, light path and a shorter physical space. Um, I personally like reflectors, but we also have some really nice refractors uh, that do great for looking at planets. And so if you're looking at deep space objects, I've... Um, I like reflectors, uh, but if you're looking for something uh, like a planet, like Jupiter and Saturn, uh, refractors actually do a really nice job on those as well. So it also depends on what you're looking at. So um, they both have their pros. Uh, they're, they're, they're great. If you have access to one of them, that's better than having access to no telescope. The reflector will pick up more light though, right? Um, so the larger diameter you have, the more a uh, physical space the telescope has to collect light. Uh, with that said, it is very hard to make a very large diameter lens. So that's why when you get into larger telescopes, you, they are all are reflectors because you can make a mirror that is much, much larger um, than you can make a, a lens without any um, imperfections in it. So when you get into, um, you know, like eight inch telescopes, which are again, nice backyard telescope, you know, all the way up to the 30 meter telescope that they're building on Hawaii. Uh, though a lot of those are gonna be using mirrors. So they're gonna be reflectors. Um, they can gather more light because again, larger mirror in the back, but there's other things about a telescope uh, about how well it does collect light. So the size of the telescope is not everything. Uh, there's another feature called the F, um, kind of like the F-stop. If it's, it's very similar to, if you know any photography, terms. Um, and it's, it's like how fast or how um, how well does the telescope respond? Um, and so that's another factor. But a diameter is just one one way to tell how well it will collect light. And what kind of magnification do you need to see some of the really interesting deep sea, ob uh, deep sea, deep space objects, or for example, the rings on Jupiter, or to see the color in various nebula? Um, so seeing like the rings around Saturn, you don't need much. Galileo had a really basic telescope when he first saw it. He was the first person to point a telescope at those objects. I think he maybe had a magnification of 10 
And so if we go back to uh, your telescope here through the, the kit, you already have well past what Galileo saw and he saw the moons around Jupiter. He saw Saturn's rings. Um, so you were already well ahead of what, what Galileo saw way back when. Um, for deep space objects like the ring nebula, um, we took that picture from the belt. We took that kind of the gray black and white picture here from the bell using one of our eight inch telescopes and our camera. So our camera helped us stack the image. So it almost kind of helped uh, trick our eye um, into looking at the image longer. Um, so you don't need much, um, but you do need to spend some time uh, looking at it. And everybody's eyes are different. So sometimes you might have to look off to the side and use peripheral vision to kind of activate the, the black and white sensors in your eye to see some of those deeper space objects. Um, I would definitely start with a wider field of view uh, than trying to narrow it down too far. Um, when like narrowing it down with using the eight millimeter setting on the eyepiece. So start large, start with your 24 millimeter setting. And then as you keep that object centered, then you can start uh, adjusting your magnification. Oh, uh, I like I'm sorry, I'm being a, there's so many questions, but how do you evaluate what a good telescope is? So if I go out and I wanna buy a tele, I understand you can't recommend a brand to me or whatever probably, but how do I know if I'm getting into something that, you know, is worth the money or, you know, a, a good telescope? Yep. Um, first, look for something, uh, some of your, your telescopes that you might find on the shelf. Oh, my lights are turning off. Let's see if I can turn them back on. There we go. Um, look for something that says glass optics. You do not want to buy a telescope that has plastic optics. And so a lot of those uh, ones are like, hey, a telescope for 20 bucks. Great deal. It's not. Um, they're not going to be very good optics. Um, so definitely look for something that, that'll, uh, that will say glass on them. Um, there are several good brands out there. Again, I can't recommend any specific, specific one, um, but you can find a nice telescope for just a couple hundred. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend anything that's under a hundred though. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, do you have any tips for people with glasses, like how to, yeah. Everybody's different. So everybody's eyes focus differently. So that's one of the things that uh, everybody who looks up, whether it's you, whether it's a, a student who's with you or a friend, um, you will have to adjust the focus yourself. Now it's up to you if you'd prefer to look through the eyepiece with your glasses or not. Um, so if we look at the uh, picture here of the scope that comes in the kit, the focus, which everybody will have to adjust themselves, so whoever finds the object if you're focused on the moon, will get it started there, but then each person will have to adjust it. So this kind of, there's two knobs, um, they do the same thing, so they're connected by that rod there. Um, you'll just have to adjust it slightly, and really it depends on if you're more comfortable looking with, with or without your glasses. It's a, per, a personal choice. I wear glasses, but I also wear contacts. I have not noticed anything um, that would compromise my my view if I choose to wear my glasses while looking. You might have to, like if you're looking through the eyepiece here, you might have to uh, kind of move your head a little bit around because uh, sometimes it does take some practice for everybody to kind of see how the light comes through the eyepiece. Um, and then depending on what it is, you might have to back up just a little bit or you might have to go in a little bit closer and you can always can adjust the, the focus then. If you back your eye up a little bit, you can always adjust the focus of the eyepiece um, to kind of bring it into view for you. Um, I have always loved outer space. So a question came in through the chat. Um, so my dad taught me how to find or the Orion constellation. And for a long time, I didn't realize that was a winter constellation. So I'd try to find it even in the summertime. So I've always had a fascination with space. And um, so just it, all this is just stuff I've picked up throughout my life. I love looking at the stars through a telescope. I work here at the Bell Museum um, in the planetarium. So I get to see the stars every day, but nothing beats actually seeing the stars through your own eyes and looking at through the telescope. So as great as the planetarium is, seeing things through the telescope is way better. Um, and I always recommend that if you have a chance to do it, do that. Um, so just, it's a lifetime of, of personal interest and a passion of mine. So, yeah. Are there any other questions anything anybody else is wondering about? Okay. Well, I'll put my contact information back up um, just in case 
Anybody else has any last questions they want to ask me or send me an email later on if you're wondering about, I am happy to answer them. There we go. There, that's quicker way. Uh, so that's my information here. I work for the Bell Museum here at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'd ha be happy to chat with you. I'd love to see you here at the Bell Museum here, get a chance to, to join us. So thank you for your time this evening and good luck and clear skies this summer with the telescope. Thanks so Thank much. you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you.